Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to everyone. Why is my screen so dark? Good morning, Prof. How is everyone doing? Alhamdulillah, so far so good, Prof. Okay, hanging in there. Inshallah. We're getting close to the end of the semester, people. Just a few more weeks to go. Jaza. Hi, Siang. Okay, so I hope you guys are all doing well and um, surviving another semester lockdown and online. So today we are in week 12, which means we only have two more classes after this week. Um, so the semester is really flying by. So, but tonight, uh, today will be our, probably our last full class. Uh, next week and the, uh, the last week, we will just probably do, I'll just do the lecture pretty much and then um, leave the rest of the class time for you to uh, work on your uh, proposals, okay? So I'm going to give you time in class to do that. Um, I know it's getting towards the end of the semester, and you guys probably have a ton of assignments. So um, I don't want to overburden you with uh, with too much work uh, for these last few weeks. But today we will probably have we we won't go. I'm sure we won't go to two o'clock, but we will probably have more more or less a full class. But um, the last two weeks, I will um, I'll I'll we'll just have kind of short classes. I do have to cover the, I do have to cover the lecture material though, because um, for your final exam um, for that purpose. Okay. So just to give you a heads up on that. All right. Um, so let me pull up. Are there any questions um, before we start? Any questions or concerns from anyone? Nothing? Okay. So let me. Okay, I see a question. Oh no. Anissa said no, nothing. Okay. Um, all right, so week 12, so this is week 12. So you can see here our um, agenda for today. I changed it um, kind of last minute. I added a component to it. So we're, I, in the WhatsApp group, I mentioned we're gonna do the, um, the final two presentations and we will do that. But first we're gonna do a, um, another short activity before that, okay? So we're gonna use our Mentimeter poll again, but um, this time I'm gonna have you reflect on a slide I'm going to show you in a minute. So before I do that, let me um, just, uh, so I, I put up the grades, the marks yesterday for assignment one. So um, congratulations, uh, most of you did a nice job. Uh, I really enjoyed the videos. I did give a, I did give more weight to the written assignment though, um, only because um, the video is based really on the written assignment um, and it's more of a synopsis of the, what's in the written assignment. So I did give more weight to the written assignment, but I, I, I really wanted you to do the videos as well. It's good practice for you guys, um, especially in terms of your, your public speaking and presentation skills and all that. So I did want to, um, so I did, of course, I, I did take into account that one, but um, I did give more weight for the written part. Um, but most of you did very well. Um, and I, I said I would give you feedback. And so I did write comments on many of them, although especially the ones that were done very well, um, I didn't write a whole lot, but um, I do have some comments on a lot of them. And we, so I'm not sure what's the easiest way to get them back to you guys. If you'd like to see your, if you'd like to see any of my comments, um, what do you guys think about that? Would you like me to return them to you or 
it doesn't matter, you don't really care. What do you think? We just have to find a way. I'm not sure how to get it back to you unless I, I do it. We do it through Pucha Blast. I guess I can return it through Pucha Blast to you. It'll go to your UPM email. Anyone have any suggestions? Anyone? Suggestions? Is anybody... UPM email. Sorry, Fikia? Someone said maybe uh, you can return through UPM email. All right, so I can just upload it back through Pucha Blast? Uh, Pucha Blast also can. Yeah, I think that's the, because I don't think I have, otherwise I have to go find your emails. But in Pucha Blast, I think automatically I can just upload it back and then it'll automatically go to your UPM email. Okay. Is that all right with everyone? Yes, Prof. Okay. Thank you uh, for sharing, Figya. Um, so I guess I will go and do that. Um, so. Does anyone have any questions about the um, the assignment or their mark or anything you'd like to ask now? You can also, of course, contact me individually if you have any specific questions about your, your marks or your assignment. And then, um, so, in, so after, in addition to that, the final exam, just a reminder, uh, we will have it on Ju July 12th, okay? So 11.30 to 1.30. And so next week I will um, next week I will discuss a little bit about the exam on how to uh, prepare for the final and what the content will be. Just, sorry, I just want to make a note to myself. Okay. All right. So, um, so if there's no questions, then let's start on our uh, first activity. So I'm going to show you quickly here. Uh, this is a model of sustainable development. Okay. Uh, you can find this in Pucha Blast. I should show you this. Okay, so here, if you click on this uh, link here, either one of these, eight components of sustainable communities or the slide here, if you click on this one, it'll um, automatically go and uh, you can download the slide and then open it. All right, um, and it's a slide, uh, like I just showed you, it's this slide here on this model of sustainable communities. Okay, so we haven't talked a whole lot about sustainability in, in particular, our focus this semester and this class is more on community development, but of course, sustainability of communities is a very important part of community development because we want to, of course, um, any efforts we make toward developing the community should also, of course, consider um, the sustainability of the community. Right. Who, would, who can tell me what sustainability means? What does that word mean, really? Anyone? In your own words, just in your own words, what do you understand by the word sustainable in English? I don't know what the word is in Bahasa. Anyone would like to share? Long lasting. Okay. That's one way to think about it. Long lasting. Anyone else? What's another way of, another word for sustainable? Come on, somebody. Can you make me call on you guys again? Prof? Yeah. Prof, 
how about consistency? How about what? Sorry. Consistency. The consistently Consist being fulfilled. Yeah, that's a good word. Consistency. Yep. So long lasting consistency. I heard another male voice. Somebody was going to say something. Who was that? Adi uh, Afro. Adi. Oh, uh, yeah. sorry. I didn't see the chat box. You guys have been answering the chat box. I apologize. Okay, Hadi. Yeah, what what word did yeah, you want to? Uh, sustainable, maybe usable. Bro. Okay, usable, right? So usable for a long period of time, right? Uh, yeah. So yes, yeah, okay. Consistency, things that be continued, continuous. Yeah, you guys got it. Maintain the community, maintainable, right? All right, good. Those are all good. Good ways of thinking about uh, sustainable. Yeah, so we so it's not enough just to develop the community. Then you have to make it so that it's lasting, so that future generations can also benefit from it, right? So it's not just for us, but it's for those who come after us. You know, it's having a more of a long term vision of developing the community. Okay, so this model here by um, well, it's a combination of authors, but. Um, they've identified eight components there. Okay, so we see governance, okay, which which has to do with government, basically leadership, all right, how effective and uh, inclusive the governing structure is of the community. Transportation, we've talked about infrastructure, transportation and connectivity, services provided in the community, the environmental aspect of the community, equity, is it is it fair for everyone? Is it equal? Um, in terms of those that benefit from it and those that participate, um, is the economy, you know, thriving and flourishing? Uh, how about the housing uh, stock in the community? Is it well designed? Is it uh, sufficient for everyone in the community? Is there enough housing? And then social and cultural uh, sustainability. Okay, so um, is there a vibrant social life? Is there cultural? Um, uh, is there a strong cultural element to? the community and so forth. So so these are all, uh, these are the eight components in this model of sustainable community. So what I want to do now is if you guys can just open this slide on your own um, devices, because I'm going to switch screens here. I'm going to go to our Mentimeter um, polling software, because I want us to now try to rate. Okay, can you guys see the Mentimeter there? Yes, bro. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna run yes, this, bro. and then I want you guys to, and I'm gonna do this too. I want us to rate Malaysia as a whole, and it's kind of hard because Malaysia is a diverse place. So we have, you know, different. We have many communities within Malaysia. But if we could just sort of simplify this activity, try to think about Malaysia as a whole, you know, as a as a single community, and let's try and rate or rank. I don't know what you call it. Um, these eight dimensions of sustainable community uh, from the perspective of Malaysia as a whole. Okay, so on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the, the sustainability of the environment in Malaysia, uh, the governance structure or the governance in Malaysia, according to those eight dimensions that I just showed you. Okay, so you may have to refer back to the slide, um, but go ahead and sign on. Uh, you may want to study the slide for a minute and then go ahead and provide your answers there. It'd be interesting to see what kind of things we come up with um, in terms of how we see the sustainability of Malaysia. Okay, so yeah, the Mentimeter, so one is not at all sustainable. Five is highly sustainable, okay? So for example, the environment, in terms of environmental sustainability, Currently in the country, do we see the environment as sustainable or not sustainable? Okay, so that's the kind of that's the kind of thing you want to answer. So let's go ahead and do that.
Yeah, this these these require a bit of they require a bit of thought. Actually, I'm going through it myself. You have to think about this a little bit. And it's also hard to do it for an entire country, right? Hmm. All right, what do we got so far here? Social cultural. Service. All right. Okay, Farhana, your question here. Um, the environment is in terms of the negative or positive things that we want to measure here. Well, if we look at that, um, if we look at the slide um, on the eight elements that I showed you just now, so it says they're environmentally sensitive, providing places for people to live that are considerate of the environment. Okay, so that's really what it's referring to there. So I guess the scale would be one to five, how environmentally sensitive. Um, is is the way we're living really in Malaysia? You know, what I mean, in terms of how we're living, are we sensitive to the environment? Right. Um, I guess that's the way you would you would uh, rate it. Okay, we got twenty two so far. Just give um, a couple more minutes for the remaining people to answer. Okay, can we have our, okay, it's 25. I find these polls really interesting to do with you, to do with you guys, because I really like to see how young people are thinking about their their country uh, and their society uh, from all these different perspectives. It's really interesting to me. Okay, so we've got 25. I'm Maybe there's a few more of you that want to answer. Go ahead if you want to still answer, that's fine. Um, so let's just discuss here, so good job. So we've got the highest score going to social and cultural sustainability, okay? Not surprising, that's not really surprising to me. Um, my take on that is, and I could be totally different than yours, but you have a very rich sort of social and cultural um, society. Um, you know, you're, you're, uh, socially, it's a very vibrant place, Malaysia. And I think also culturally, you have so many different cultures here and um, a very rich culture. So that one is not surprising to me, uh, that that, was, that would be the highest. Um, and I agree, I think that is one of the most sustainable aspects of your culture, uh, of your society. 
Um, transport and connectivity, okay. Also, you also gave it a pretty high score. Uh, I think I also gave that one a pretty high score. I think Malaysia, um, that's one of the strengths of, of the country is definitely the, and that is increasing, I think, as as well. If we look at things like the new MRT that's coming in KL, they're expanding the LRT. So at least in the rural areas, we have the East Coast um, Railway that's coming, right, uh, in a few years. You know, so they're, they're, the government is uh, continuously trying to in, improve on the transport and connectivity aspect. Um, so I think, yeah, I would agree that there's a lot of, uh, there should be a lot of optimism for the future, especially in terms of transport and connectivity. Um, I, I, I agree with that one. So then you had the environment at 3.4, okay. Now it's interesting that most of the scores are right around three. So, and the average, as you can see down here at the bottom, your average score down here as overall is a 3.2. So it's, it's right smack in the middle, really. Um, so you see, your country as a whole as being essentially moderately sustainable. Okay. And I think that's a really good assessment. I think there's a lot of truth in that equity, economy, housing, services, environment, all around three. All right. Um, quite interesting. Yeah. Now, of course, because of the pandemic, you know, economy, I'm sure is a lot lower than it may would maybe would have been otherwise. Right. Um, uh, equity, of course, in Malaysia, there's always the tension of equity, not only equity between racial groups, but also equity between income, you know, the B40, the upper 40, the upper whatever, upper 20, upper 10, you know, so there's a lot of tension there between uh, equity is a big issue now, as we've talked about throughout the semester. So that makes a lot of sense that there'd be a, a sort of average or moderate score there. Housing as a three, who would like to share? Anyone want to share why you gave housing? Uh, or why do you think housing is, if you look at the, most of the scores are sort of here in the middle. Anybody want to share why you gave that housing only a three? I'm a little bit surprised by that. Anybody want to share your response? Afro? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as for me, I think. Yeah, I uh, housing practice is considered as in the middle because I think maybe right now uh, I think how to say it eh? maybe the government I think maybe they can uh, do a little bit more in changing how uh, we call it how the development of housing nowadays because I think I think everyone setuju but everyone uh, will we understand right now because uh, despite the pandemic, actually before this, before this, uh, before the pandemic, uh, I think the housing in uh, the housing in Malaysia is considered very high, right, Prof? I see. In Penang, in, in KL, also the we call it this, there there is no standardized price for the yeah the, the right. So basically, in Penang, the price is considered very high, right? In KL, yeah. also considered very high. So maybe for me, think the government can come up with some solution, maybe to uh, standardize the price, maybe maybe in Penang, it is considered high because of its maybe cultural, or maybe the, what you call it, the place for vacation, right? So basically, maybe yeah. after this, the government can maybe uh, put a solution uh, so that put some solution uh, to, uh, to the housing factor there. That's for me. Okay. Thank you, Prof. All right, great. Thank you, Hadi, for those inputs. Um, several of you, Farhana, Shaza, Jesse, all talking about the price. Uh, oh no, Farhana, you just said you rated it four. Um, yeah, Shaza and Jesse also mentioned the price. I think it's very true. I mean, I think once housing prices get to be so expensive that the issue of sustainability definitely comes in because, you know, is it really sustainable to have housing prices that are so high that majority of the people cannot afford them, especially young people. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very fair, you know, it's a very fair perspective to have. Uh, and, and we know this among, I mean, among our, our students, our recent graduates, um, the other young people that we know that they just cannot afford to, to buy their own house, even though they may have jobs, they may have decent paying jobs, but they still cannot even afford to buy a house in the KL area, for example. Uh, it's, it, it is definitely becomes an issue of sustainability. 
um, those prices. So I think that's a very fair response. Uh, Farhana, you gave it a four. Would you like to explain maybe why you saw it as a four? Maybe you saw it a bit differently. You can either write your answer or you can speak it out. I guess she, maybe she's typing her answer. Yes, bro. I'm typing my answer. That's fine. That's fine. I fig I figured as much. Anybody else want to share while she, while, Far while Farhana is typing away? Anybody else want to share? So let's okay. So let's just talk about one more governance. Okay, so governance is the lowest at 2.6. Uh, not surprising. But would anybody like to share your thoughts on governance? Why you gave it so such a low? I'm really curious. It's a very, it's a very important. This is a very important issue. I mean, let's not, let's not, um, you know, let's not uh, sugarcoat things. Let's be honest. We're not talking about politics here. We're talking about governance, right? So it doesn't matter which party is in power. We're talking about the quality of governance for sustainability. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. So would anybody like to comment as to why you think that we should be concerned about governance for sustainability? Anybody want to share? Since you all gave us, well, most of you gave it a very low score. So I'm very curious. Anyone? Okay. All right, so anyway, let's see. Farhana just gave her answer here. So she rated four because she sees housing is built uh, built more and more every year. Okay, so the housing stock is growing every year. That's true. But when I see all rate right, three, I give answer now. <laughs> no, Farhana, you don't have to change. You don't have to change your, your score just because others scored a three. You are looking at it from the perspective of the housing stock, which is fair. It is. It is still growing. There's no question. If you, Even if you drive around KL, you'll see there's a lot of new housing stock going up. Okay. So that is not, that's, that is true. That is, there's nothing wrong with, um, with that assessment. Uh, and at the same time, the others are all, they also make a good point that that housing stock is mostly very expensive and it's hard to afford for a lot of people. So both of those things are true. Both of those things are true. Okay. So don't feel um, like you need to change your answer. Although maybe, you know, you didn't consider the, the, the price issue. Okay, so that is something definitely to consider when it comes to sustainability. But those both of those issues are important when it comes to sustainability, both the housing availability, the number of houses, the amount of housing that's available, but also the, the prices. And Nabila just shared with us, high housing price creates an opportunity for the high incomes to jack up the price and rent it to low incomes and less accessible for them to own. Excellent, excellent point, Nabila. So here we start, we, here we get into the sort of the the market dynamics of housing, right? So um, not only that, but the but the rent, the even the rent prices are going to continue to go up as well, making it even more difficult for young people and lower income people to even afford to rent houses um, or apartments, flats, and so and so forth. And if they do, they have to spend more and more of their income on housing. So, for example, does anybody know what is the standard? Um, how much should you pay per month on housing? Anybody know what percentage of your monthly income should you spend on housing? Does anybody know the answer to that question? There's a sort of, you know, economists have sort of figured out like you shouldn't pay more than this month, this much, this percentage of your monthly income on housing, in order to maintain a fair, you know, a, a budget that's, you know, not, not too, you know, that you can afford basically. Does anybody know what percentage you should you should spend? You should maximum, you know, maximum amount you should spend on housing per month. See up with that one, anyone? Maybe you've heard some like financial planners talk about this or something. They always have those courses for young people on financial planning, managing your money. You guys should think about this. This is important to know. What percentage of your monthly income should you spend on housing? Okay. Somebody guess. No one's answering. Somebody take a guess. Take a guess. Okay, 20 to 30%. 200 to 300 per month, 30%. Okay. 
Depends on the salary. Okay, 20%. All right, yeah. So they they basically say um, on average, you know, of course it depends, but on average about um, the maximum should be about one third. So you guys who said 30%, yeah. Um, yeah, 20 to 30%, exactly. So at most one third of your salary per month should go to housing, right? Um, but but in reality, a lot of young people, um, a lot of people, not just young people, a lot of people are spending close to 50% of their monthly income on housing, okay, because it's so expensive, right? So this is a this is a big problem. This is a very big problem. And it's not sustainable. That is not sustainable because if you spend so much money on housing, that means that it means little left to do anything else. Um, you know, so it, it is a big problem. Okay, so that's housing. Anyone want to comment on governance? Please, just somebody. One person has to say something about governance before we can go and move on to the next activity. <laughs> You've got uh, it, Prof. Can I try? Yeah, yeah of course. Let's go ahead. Honey. Okay, Prof. Okay, I think regarding the governance, why I think everyone puts the the governor in the we call it in the not sustainable yeah. part is because maybe right now I think we can see right the government is quite shaky and the decision making sometimes we can see that uh sometimes decision making was uh, can be quite okay but uh, it can be also be what you call it the it, it can also uh reflect to other uh factors basically yeah. so for example the education for example right uh, uh education and maybe other points <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 So there's other outside influences. Is that what you mean? Ah, uh, yes. Basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. There's a lot of outside influences. I mean, uh, Jesse mentioned political influence. So when you talk about sustainability, I mean, sustainability governance for sustainability has to be long-term thinking, right? It has to be visionary. It has to be long-term. You know, you have to think about what the decision I make today. How is it going to affect? The country or the community five years from now 10 years from now 20 years from now right and so like i think what you guys are hinting at you all corruption is a whole nother issue jesse we're gonna get to that in a second but what we're, what we're hinting at there is that uh, when there's political influence that's not in the best interest of the long-term benefits of the country you know then of course that then it's not then a lot of the decisions made are not sustainable because they're only for the short term Right. And so a lot of the a lot of the criticism of government in general is that they only make decisions in five year windows because that's when the elections are right. Elections every five years. So they don't think beyond five years. Right. So, you know, five years and then a, a new government comes in or a new minister comes in and the policy changes because they're not thinking about the long term benefits and well-being of the country. They're thinking about just their election cycle so that they can get reelected. Okay, and that's just that is just a reality everywhere. You go to the United States, you go to Russia, you go to Germany. Politicians, that's the way they think. Most of the time, they're just thinking about those short-term um, decisions. Okay, so so that affects sustainability because if you're not thinking about the long term, you're not planning for the long term. Your policies are not going to reflect the long-term uh, benefit of the country, right? And so I think a lot of you guys, a lot of young people, a lot of people in general are think are seeing. A lot of government decisions nowadays along those lines. They're not. They're not making decisions, or they you, you perceive them as not making decisions that are for the benefit of the long-term sustainability of the country. Right? Um, corruption is a whole other issue because corruption is absolutely it is the dagger that destroys and kills sustainability. You because it 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 takes away from investment. The way you build for a sustainable future is investing, right? So I invest in your education so that 20 years from now, you can be a productive member of society, giving back to society, working, paying taxes and all that, right? So it's an investment. But because of corruption, that money for investment gets taken, gets stolen by people. And it just you're just stealing from the future. So when you commit corruption, you're stealing from the future is essentially what you're doing. And so, of course, yes, it is. It is the death knell of sustainability. All right. So yeah, corruption is a big, really big problem when it comes to sustainability. 
I think for governance, so Fikia has here, I think, I think for governance, we can still see the corruption happening. Yeah, unjust treatment given by the higher ups and the citizens do not trust the government yet because of those issues. Yeah, and that, and that, and those things will definitely all affect, they'll all affect sustainability. Um, and even the lack of trust among the citizens, between the citizens, the right yet, and the, the leaders off, also affects sustainability because if, this, if the people don't trust their leaders, Right, then you're gonna have this constant changing of, of of government, changing of people, of leaders and stuff, and it's very hard to make policy sustainable that way, you know, over the long term when you have this constant change, constant flux, because people don't trust their leaders. Um, yeah, so that's that's a good good analysis uh, there. Okay, so sustainability is a hard, it's a really hard issue to address. Um, but it requires uh, it requires a lot of investment in the future, and the other thing is that a lot of people are just not, you know, like I think, and I'm not trying to choose sides in any way. I'm you know I'm not trying to be politically uh, trying to choose a side here, but I think I do think that the previous government they were trying to in some ways address some of the long term issues, you know, thinking more about sustainability of the country for the future, maybe than some of the you know, previous governments. Um, and that's not about party preference. That's just about fact. I mean, just some of the policies that they had enacted, you know, I think there was a sort of more of a, of a, of a concern for sustainable, a sustainable future. Right. Um, and, you know, that's just the way, the way I, I think the way that they formulated their policies. Uh, let's see. Nabila says, I think the policy to be able to lump up party shows how unsustainable. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, think about that. You know, you vote for a certain party because they say that they are they stand for these issues or they stand for these things, and then those people they they jump to another, so they completely abandon whatever vision that party had for the country for the future, and that's where the trust and that's where a lot of the trust issues come in, right? And so it's impossible to have a sustainable system when that happens. Yeah. So I agree. I agree with that, Nabila. Um, and it's just a hard thing to change because the people, the people who need to change that policy are the people that are doing it, right? So the leaders that are actually doing these things are the ones that you you need them to, to change the system. So obviously they're not going to change a system that they benefit from, and that's part of the problem. Uh, we have this the same issue in the United States. In the U.S., they have the same issue with um, the U.S. system is very different. In Malaysia, in Malaysia, people talk about part um, money politics, right? Money politics. In the U.S., the system is money politics. Um, so, money politics is part of the democratic system there. You know, so people can give money to political parties there. It's it's part of the system, and usually, you know, the parties that collect the most money win the <laughs> win the election. So it's a really strange system. Um, but that also that also has created a lot of problems, and people want that system to be changed. The problem is, is that the people that have to change the system are the ones that are benefiting from it because they're the ones that are, that are getting the money, right? So you expect the people that are benefiting from it to change the system, but they, they're not going to change the system because they're benefiting from it. So that's the catch-22. The catch it's a problem. It is a problem, okay? You know, just like here, uh, Lompot Party is a problem as well, but the people that need to change it are the ones that are doing the Lompotting, <laughs> okay? So that's the problem. Anyway, okay, thank you very much, guys, for your um, inputs, for your participation. Um, it's an interesting discussion uh, and an interesting issue. Um, but I think it ties in well with what we're talking about in the class um, because sustainability is a very big a very big issue when you talk about community development. Nobody wants to develop or build a community just for tomorrow. We want to, you know, we want to think about the long-term sustainability of our communities. And I think that you guys as HRD, um, coming from an HRD background, I think it's sort of built into the way you've been trained and educated and um, the thinking behind HRD. You know, the philosophy of HRD is very much sustainability in the sense that it's about building up people's skills and their knowledge. And those are all sustainable qualities. Those are all the qualities of sustainability that, that we need. So, um, okay, so now I would like to continue if possible with our two group presentations that we did not finish last week. So I think it was groups two or rooms two and three that didn't get a chance to present. Can we have- um, Group five, uh, it's group five actually. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I think I got the numbers and wrong. Okay. Five and? Oh, five and two. Okay, so whichever one would like to go first, feel free. Uh, maybe group five, if you're, if you're ready. Can you go first? Yeah, sure. I'll share mine. Okay, go ahead, Nabila. Uh, hi, we are from room five. Uh, I'm going to pass this slide to Hanisa. Uh, okay, uh, I will start uh, for the first slide, which is uh, focus uh, of the evaluation in this program. So what we get in this program, first, uh, poverty rate, which is uh, we want to... Uh, we to see that uh, the weather program has uh, solved the poverty problems in Bima City or not. And second one is uh, infrastructure development. Uh, this is uh, because we want to see how uh, important of the infrastructure system in Bima City to increase the resident quality of life. And last, is our uh, well-being which uh, which is uh we see if the resources like clean water and drainage system or security are uh, being used effectively for right. this program okay so, so uh what's your well-being yeah okay yeah so i will pass to the next presenter for the next slide oh Thank you guys you. are really Egalitarian. Everyone gets a role to play. Very good. Okay, thank you, Hanisa. Uh, so for the uh, kind of the data that we decided to correct from the program is uh, the qualitative and the quantitative data. The qualitative data we will uh, correct. Uh, will be corrected through the observations and the interview and. For the quantity data, we will correct us through the survey and also the secondary data. And all uh, both of these data will be corrected from the BIMA city community and the organizers of the project uh, before, during, and after the program to see the how the program can be successful conducted uh, uh, according to the community needs. So uh, that's all from me. I will pass to Bila. Okay, that's a very thorough evaluation. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the th third step is that uh, how the data will be analyzed. Uh, the data will be analyzed through its efficiency to see is the resources equally and fast uh, distributed. Secondly, uh, through significance to see does the program really help the city to build a new life after the deadly flood. And lastly, through effectiveness to see does the life quality of Bima City residents um, improve or not. Uh, and for the last step, um, the information should be received uh, by several stakeholders like Ministry of Public World and Housing, Asian Development Bank, um, the community of Bima City, uh, Rukun Tetangga Rukun of Bima City, local and central government, and all of those that directly involved in the project. And information uh, will be shared through emails, uh, reports, and website. That's all from us. Thank you. Mila, can you just go to slide four quickly? Go back to slide four. Slide four. Okay. So let me ask you. Based on your, based on the evaluation methods that you proposed, you proposed qualitative and quantitative. So, for example, if for the issue of if significance. How might you analyze or how, how might you conduct the evaluation for significance? Can you think offhand of how you might do that? Does the program really help Bima City to build a new life after the deadly What kind of data would you collect on that? That, 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 that can answer that question. I think uh, both uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, can help in um gather gather the data and, and uh to see the significance 
for example, for qualitative, we can do our interview to see, you know, uh, to see the the feedbacks from the community. Right. While it, while as uh, quantitative, uh, we can do surveys. Um, build a new life. Build a new life here. We can um evaluate through a few variables. For example, like the the does the water um does the water uh uh accessible for them and does it really help them? Yeah. Uh, and compare it uh, from before and after. Yep. Yep. That's exactly it. You can you would do a sort of uh, sort of it's sort of like a pre and post kind of test where you know you would give them a survey before you start the program and then give them the survey after the program and see what the difference is right in terms of the effectiveness of the water uh, of the water projects and so forth so and then yeah you're absolutely right you could do interviews to better understand their their perceptions as to why those why those things how what is the sort of qualitative changes in their life you know how does it affect other aspects of their life you know, maybe um, having those resources now has freed up um, freed up time for them to do other things. You know, so there's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of different ways you could um, evaluate those things. So, okay. All right, great. Thanks, group five. Thank you. All right. Very good. Okay. And last but not least, group two. Are we having trouble with the slides? Oh, you don't have slides. Oh, as soon as I said that. Oh, look at that. Uh, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good morning, group of and our fellow friends. Yeah. Uh, we are from group two. And we will present our answer for last week's class. Uh, first of all, I will introduce my group members. Uh, there are four of us, which are Farhana, Baujin Yu, Liu Enji, and also Saliha. Next, I will answer the first question. Next. Uh, the first question is, what aspects of the program or outcomes will you evaluate and why? Uh, our answer for this question is... Um, the aspect... 
uh, the aspect of the program or outcomes that we will be focusing on based on the article is the well-being of the people, which okay. is before and also after the project that has been conducted. Uh, well-being means the state of being comfortable, happy, and also healthy. Uh, based on the seven dimensions of wellness, uh, well-being includes social, emotional, spiritual, environmental, occupational, intellectual, and also physical well-being. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the data that will be collected uh, by asking the people how their life has changed compared to the previous situation regarding all of these aspects compared to when they needed to live in the slums along the bank it was easily flooded when it rained. Uh, this is because we think that well-being is one of the most important aspects to be evaluated when dealing with people. Uh, this aspect also uh, can be seen as the aspect that was affected the most from this project as well-being itself covers uh, various aspects. Uh, next, I will pass to Li Wenji for the second question. Okay, so ultimately this is a project on well-being. Enhancing well-being. Okay, next. So next, I will go continue my parts, which is uh, uh, data connection. The next thing will be the what kind of data will, will we connect or from whom? Uh, next page. So from our, so based on the case study, the evaluations will be carried out at midterm and uh, at the end of project with my project performance. And to the largest extent possible and the project outcome. And also from our suggestion, the evaluations will draw on the quantitative and the qualitative approaches to assess specific concepts of the project implementation. And for the quantitative, we Decide will be taken though the questionnaires where the for the <coughs> qualitative data will be taken from the conducting an uh, interview with the uh, residents that are involved in this project. And also the data will be connected from the people that received help from the this project. So that's all for me. I will pass it to the next presenter. Next, who's next? Okay, who's next to present? Hello? Oh, back to Farhana. You guys okay? I don't hear anything. Uh, uh, the uh, third question, our group member have an uh, accident. So I will introduce the last oh. question. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the last question is how will you report your uh, uh, findings? The question is who should receive the information about the evaluation and uh, which stakeholders, how will you share the information? So about who uh, received the information, we think about its, pro, uh, its, project, uh, uh, its project planner and the beneficiaries of project is uh, the re residents. And uh, the next, which stakeholders I would think is local governments and communities and uh, how to share the in, uh, information. We think is by sharing and, uh, analyzing the data recorded during the project 
And next is compare the benefits gained from the beginning of the project and the process of the project. And last we think is the pre presentation will include the government's uh, project beneficiaries and project organizers, analyze and explain the result of the process of the project and so on like this. So that's all for my part. All right, thank you, Jinyu. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, okay. So I noticed this group, um, don't forget the evaluation is not only on the recipients of the, because in a community development project, you, uh, you know, your, your, that project is for the, for the whole community. So the recipients may be a very wide um, range of people. Um, so of course, obviously the people that immediately benefit those who live in that particular area, who, for example, those who are using those services of water and sanitation and so forth, but there may be others, the implementers, you know, uh, the, um, even the policymakers can also be included in an evaluation as sort of complementary data. Okay, so don't, so when you think about community development evaluation, of course, the, the primary, uh, target group for the evaluation is going to be the recipients, but don't forget the people that are involved in the process as well. Okay. So that's something you may, may also want to consider for your evaluation. All right. Um, so thank you groups um, for that uh, commentary on the case study. So I think it's, uh, we've already been at it for an hour. Why don't we take a five minute break before we start the lecture for this week? Okay. Okay, bro. Sure. See you guys in five minutes.
Okay. Welcome back. All right. So today's um, lecture, we'll be talking about community development in the urban setting. Okay, the urban community. Um, so let me just pull up my All right. Can everybody see the slide? You guys there? Are you back? Maybe you're not even back yet. Yes. Oh, oh you are there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So what to expect in the urban community? So urban, I mean, community, community development well, community development is very different in depending on where you're doing it. So um, in rural areas, the needs are much different than in the urban areas. But urban community development is very unique because urban communities are so diverse. Okay, so some of the ways that they are diverse Um, based on the nature of urban communities, okay? So in most urban communities, you have great diversity in terms of race, religion, culture, background, et cetera, right? Socioeconomic background, right? You have, um, usually you have some of the most extremes in terms of uh, socioeconomic status, wealth, and so forth. You have very wealthy people living in urban areas and you have very poor people living in urban areas. And often they live very close together, Right, which is a total, which is a totally different dynamic. Um, if you go to rural areas where people usually have much more land, they're sp more spread out. You know, um, the 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 physical communities are not necessarily um, interacting so cl closely with one another based on the the way that those uh, communities are geographically spaced. So, urban communities are very very um, unique in that sense. You have a variety of occupations, education levels, income levels, um, places of work. So you have downtown, you know, where all the big corporations are. You have often you have um, industrial areas where there's factory activity. Uh, you have uh, commercial areas where there's just a lot of stores. And then you have areas where there's really nothing going on um, economically. You may have parks, etc. So there's it's uh, it's. A lot going on in a very small, concentrated area. So that makes community development very interesting and very uh, co complex in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, so just to sort of sum that up, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, urban communities are not homogeneous. They are very diverse. And so that makes our, um, our attempts to do community development very multi-layered you know there's very many things you have to consider when you do community development in an urban area another important aspect of community development in cities is that you often get a lot of reluctance people are hesitant to work um, with community development workers especially from the, if they're from the outside urban people tend to be a, a lot more suspicious of others maybe they have less trust in others especially outsiders Okay, so we have touched on this earlier in the semester, but in urban communities, it's 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 often much more pronounced. Um, I had this I had this personal experience, direct experience, when I was doing community development work in the U.S. Uh, and we were working in uh, communities that were they were very low income, very very uh, under resourced, underserved, and they had tremendous suspicion of outsiders. So even though we were working there for literally for many several years. You know, it was still hard for them to really trust us and to, to, to trust what we were trying to do. So you're going to get that often with um, urban residents in, in urban CD. Um, and the idea that, you know, these groups that come in to do CD are, they have ulterior motives. You know, they're there for their own glory. You know, they're there for, you know, for PR to make their organizations look good and, and all that. So 
these are some of the uh, dynamics of doing CD in urban areas. Um, often they'll treat your ideas with little enthusiasm. They won't get very excited about what you're bringing. Um, people are very hesitant to change. They don't like to leave their comfort zones. They don't like to take risks. So all these things um, can happen in community development in urban areas. So what to conclude from that is that, uh, as you can see at the bottom, is that building trusting relationships takes time and it takes a lot of patience. Community development work is not the kind of work you want to do if you're planning on making like quick, you know, quick turnaround types of stuff. Change in, in community development work, change takes a long time. Okay, so you need to really think about it from a long-term perspective. Okay, so this, is, this ties into sustainability issues, right? How to do community development to make it sustainable? You know, one-off projects are not sustainable. One-off projects may be effective in addressing a specific issue. You know, like, for example, like in the case study we just read, you know, maybe addressing issues of sanitation. Well, we can do a community development project where we, you know, we work together as a community and we lobby the government and we help, you know, to get uh, the government to, you know, in, uh, install better sanitation services or sanitation infrastructure. We can do that. That would be like a one-off project and it would have a very important impact on the community. Okay. But there may be for long-term purposes, there may be other things that need to be addressed that are not so easily changed, right? Overnight. So these are the kind of issues you deal with in the, in the urban areas. Your presence in the community as a CD worker raises expectations. Right. So once you come in with your NGO or your, you know, CSR program from the, from the corporation that you're working for, or you work for the government and you're doing a CD program, whatever it is, once you, you know, you enter the community and you say you're there to help them to, um, you know, improve this, that, or the other thing in the community, they're going to, of course, have expectations. So it's important that you do not make promises you cannot deliver. Okay. Why? Who can tell me why? Why is it important not to make promises you cannot deliver? Why is that important? If you're a CD worker, you know, you're doing community development work and you go. Um, because I think that uh, sometimes it can lead to trust issue. Yeah, absolutely. So you're there. I know we just we just mentioned that one of the important things you need to do is establish trust, right? And so Jesse very poignantly poignantly said, if you of course if you make promises you can't deliver, that's a that's an easy way to kill trust, right? So you know, oh yeah, within two months I'm gonna make sure you guys get this and you have that and we're gonna change this and we're gonna change that, and then nothing happens, right? Oh, they just see that you're all talk. And you know, you know, as they say, all talk, no action. Yeah. So of course, there's going to create huge issues of trust. So it's always good to start off by, I mean, in addition to working with the community participation, we talked about a lot. It's all, it's always good to start off with small, sort of, activities, small projects that you can easily. Uh, they call them small successes. You smart, you start off with small successes to show that you're serious, that you're sincere, and that you can deliver, right? So it's better to do that than to start off and say, oh, you know, by next week, we're going to give you a new, you know, um, 20, 20 blocks of new housing or something, something that you definitely obviously cannot deliver, all right? So it's better to start off with small victories, as they say, small accomplishments, rather than trying to promise these big achievements within a short period of time, okay? Because you don't want you do not want to make promises you cannot deliver. You don't want to give them a reason not to trust you, okay? Because you have to assume that these people are not going to really trust you from the very beginning. And you have to earn their trust. You have to earn their, um, uh, that sort of respect. Okay, so, but just by you being there, there's going to be that expectation. Okay, so conflicts and problems in the community, there's going to be conflicts and problems in the community. That's a given. In any community, you're going to have conflict. 
maybe you guys have already taken the conflict uh, resolution uh, course. Um, but there's always there's always going to be conflict. Anytime you get groups of people working together, there's conflict. All right. So the question is not avoiding conflict. It's how you deal with conflict, how you manage conflict. Uh, that's the most important thing. So it's important that you understand that and know how to do it. Learn the different techniques of managing conflict. Okay. Because there's people who have differences, they have different backgrounds, they see things differently, they see issues differently, different values, they have different interests. You know, some want things done overnight, some want things uh, done in the long term, some are thinking about the future, some are not. Some have political interests, you know. And as a CD worker, not only should you be aware of these conflicts, but you have to know how to deal with them, how to manage them, and really how to create win win situations. Okay, so it's okay that people have different interests. It's okay that people want different things. Your job is to try to create situations, win-win situations, where you can um, uh, meet the needs of as many people as you can within the community. All right, and so create, creating win-win situations is the best if if it's possible. Okay, so physical conditions. Okay. So these are actual issues that affect urban, uh, especially in urban settings. People look at you. They'll look at where you're from. They'll look at your, who you are. They'll look at your, you know, your sort of background. And, um, so things like where you come from. So for example, do you live in the community that you're working in or do you come from a different community? What kind of community do you come from? That was a big issue when I was doing community development work is they want, they want to know where, where I came from. Like, oh, you live over there, so you don't really know what the, you know, what the issues that we're dealing with are like. You know, that kind of mentality, right? So that, 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 can, that can be an issue for people. Okay, your lifestyle, you know, do you understand the people that you are trying to serve in that community? You know, they come from a different socioeconomic background, or they come from a different racial background or cultural background. Can you relate to them? Do you understand them based on your lifestyle, based on your background? That's another issue that's important. And your health, are you capable of doing the work? Because the work can be difficult. It can be a lot of time spent on the ground, in the field, you know, walking around, doing whatever, engaging in different types of activities. Are you physically healthy enough to carry out your responsibilities? This is another issue that needs to be taken into consideration. Personal satisfaction as a community development worker. All right. So working with people. Okay. A lot to do to do CD work, especially in urban areas. You really need to like. You need to enjoy working with people. All right. Um, you need to be comfortable putting yourselves in other people's shoes and understanding what things are like for them. All right. What's it like to in a be to live be living in a PPR flat where there's high high levels of crime, for example. There's a lot of you know jinaya and breaking and stuff. Or there's a lot of drug 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 use among the young people. You know, so are you how comfortable are you working with these kinds of, of, of situations, these kinds of people, people that are living in these situations? Okay, so a lot of times CD workers they do this kind of work because they, you know, they do they enjoy that. They enjoy interacting with people, they enjoy trying to help people solve these problems. It really it makes a big difference. Um do you, do you have or do you gain satisfaction from helping people improve their conditions, improving social conditions? Is this something that is, is a motivating factor for you? Um, for me personally, I was, uh, after I finished my undergraduate studies, I was going to go to um, become a lawyer. I was going to go to law school and become a lawyer in the States. Um, but then I realized that I actually preferred working with people. I, pro I preferred doing kind of social work stuff. And so I decided not to, I decided to go into social work school rather than law school. Okay, so it helps if you are, you know, in tune and in touch with your own interests, because um, that, that will make you a better CD worker if you're involved in that kind of work. You have to know how, have an interest in trying to motivate people. You know, um, CD work is really about getting people to work together for the benefit of the group, 
And, you know, it doesn't work unless people are motivated to do that. Okay. So um, if, you know, hope, hopefully if you, if you have, if you gain satisfaction, you gain that kind of personal satisfaction from doing uh, community development work, it can make a big difference. Okay. It makes a big difference. You know, you have to be interested in, and, and uh, comfortable with that role of trying to, to motivate people to change for the better. Okay. And then sincerity, ikhlas. You cannot, you cannot really do CD work without uh, ikhlas. Okay. And then just knowing, like we said, um, change comes slowly, right? So change comes slowly and expect problems and obstacles. Really at the heart of CD work is, is being a change agent, right? Uh, especially in urban areas where there's, there may be so many different issues you're dealing with in the community. Okay, so you have to sort of expect that there's going to be problems, expect that there's going to be obstacles. That's part of the work. Okay, that's part of the work. And so after a while, you realize that that, you know, that's not, it's not a big deal. It's part of the work. That's what the job is, is to overcome those problems um, by working with people and motivating them and, and, and enhancing their skills and getting them to be good problem solvers and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's part of the job. All right, that's really part of what CD work is all about. Okay. So what does community work require? Okay, especially when we talk about community work in the urban setting. Well, we just sort of touched on some of those things. Um, having the right attitude, the right ability. Okay. So it's a combination of both. It's a combination of having the right skills, the skills of things like um, working in teams, working across different groups of stakeholders, managing people's different interests and different um, values. Uh, there are different vested interests. Maybe there are different political interests. It's problem solving. Um, it's, it's all these things. And these are the kind of soft skills that people are always talking about nowadays uh, that people like you, you guys, um, need to have. Okay, so some of the abilities that are needed to do community development work, especially in urban settings, First and foremost is the ability to relate and work with the community. First and foremost, if you cannot do this, you cannot do community development work because that's the heart of the work. That's the heart of the work. So being able to interact and build rapport. And I've seen, I've seen youth workers. I've seen youth workers who are also in many ways community workers. I've seen some of these uh, youth workers that are not, they're not formally trained really that well um you know they're not they don't have bachelor's degrees they're not you know um, in terms of formal education they're not that well trained but they have this innate sort of natural ability to really work with people you know so they're incredibly skilled at you know meeting new people building relationships um even motivating people in the community to do things you know they're just sort of they have that natural personality that allows them to interact and build rapport. So that's not something that you can necessarily learn in a school setting or even like in a classroom setting like this. That's something that it's part, part of who you are, person, personality. It's also part of making an effort to go out and, and to do it. Uh, and a lot of it just comes from experience as well, just going out and, and doing it, meeting people, interacting with them uh, and so forth. So, but that's a very important ability is the ability to interact and build rapport establish good relationships okay understand the felt needs all right so and that usually doesn't take too long to understand the felt needs of a community all right so when you go into the community it's you know usually the felt needs you'll you'll get a you'll get a sense of what they what they are right away obviously this community has issues because it's poor poverty is a major issue you know, maybe uh, families, there's a lot of single mothers in the, in the community. 
So there's some family issues there. The, the, the family strengths are not there. Maybe there's issues with employment. Maybe there's a lot of unemployment in the community. Okay. There could be so many felt needs that, that are um, at play in the community. All right. So your job first and foremost is to understand what those felt needs are. And of course, that's an there's an element there of skill or ability to do that. How do you ascertain what the felt needs are of a community? Uh, as I just mentioned, the ability to motivate and organize people. Okay, and organizing people is a is a big one, and it's not easy to do. You know, being able to organize people, getting people together to do something, to do an activity. Um, a lot of times, there's just very little motivation to to join activities, for example. Right. So, how are you going to motivate them to come to your activities? How are you going to motivate them to get involved in the community development efforts? It's a big, big question, and it's it's there are some people that are just very good at it they have that ability okay so this is a really important aspect of of community development work uh, in terms of the skills and the competencies needed uh, and then from there also promoting participation so how do you keep that participation going in the community so maybe they've joined one activity maybe you had an educational activity and they joined but how do you keep them participating how do you get them to, to participate participate at a higher level, right? So that's another skill or ability that you need to have, all right? So it's here, it really comes down to how do you empower, how do you empower people in the community so that they will get involved and stay involved, all right, in the uh, community development efforts, all right? So this is, this is really important. So number one, ability to relate and work with the community, okay? Ability to share skills, to gain credibility, okay? So often one of the ways you can build trust and build credibility with community members is by sharing skills. So if you have certain skills that are useful to them, you know, maybe you have a training program and you train them on how to do something, okay? So that's gonna be an, uh, a very effective way of getting them uh, you know, to build trust and to build your credibility. Also, if they see how good you are at doing something. So for example, maybe you're teaching them on how to manage a project or manage a small project, you know, and then you provide this training program for them and they see how skilled you are at it. Of course, they will have more, um, sort of a more respect for you in that sense. Okay, so that will increase your credibility in the eyes of the stakeholders. So that's important. Uh, ability to coordinate resources and agencies. Okay, so being a resource linker, they call it in youth work, they call it a, used, a resource linker. Okay, so this is a, another big part, another major component of community development work, right? Um, can, anybody, can anybody give me an example of what kind of, of, of an, an example of, of coordinating or linking resources? What might be an example there? Say you're a community about you're you're a CD worker, you know, um, and you've been put in part in, put in charge of of managing this this community development project. What are some of the ways, or what's an example of how you might engage in a coordinated uh, in coordinating resources? Anyone? Anyone give an example? Think of an example. You can, you can use the case study we just discussed as an example there. Nobody? Okay. Well, there's many ways, of course, to do it. Sometimes it has to do with coordinating financial resources, right? So maybe linking fundraisers, you know, uh, linking sources of funds, uh, you know, um, collecting donations um, and also doing fundraisers with community members, you know, um, and then linking that to government agencies that might be willing to help out by donating certain resources. Okay, so there's the linking aspect, 
There's a locating aspect. All right. So first locating resources. And this is a big problem nowadays uh, for a lot of uh, this workers in this area because there's just not a lot of resources out there. Um, although it depends on the type of program you're doing. So some type, some programs are very popular. Some might see the clear benefit in it. So they'd be more willing to give resources, whether it's money or it's in-kind resources. Um, others may be less so. But this is where the role of, of a CD worker, they have to be very resourceful. Okay, so they have to know how to locate resources and then link those resources. Okay, and then network and synergize. So how do you bring all those resources together for the benefit of the community, right? Um, where, how, how, where do you go to identify funding, funding sources, right? So in a lot of NGOs, they will even have a position called something like development officer, okay? So in an NGO, for example, they have this development officer and this development officer's job, their entire job is just to go out and find resources. So their job 40 hours a week or whatever is just to go out and locate where these resources are. Okay, so that's uh, some example in the NGO sector. And the second one, those are, so those are some of the main, the main abilities of a CD worker, especially in the urban areas. So skills, abilities, they're similar, similarly related competencies. Um, but in addition to just having the ability to do it, you have to have the right attitude to do it. So CD workers must have the right attitude uh, to do community development work. And what is that attitude? Well, it's a commitment, right? It's a real interest in helping people. Okay, so um, if you're thinking about doing this work, you know, again, is this the kind of work that resonates with you personally? All right. And we've seen a lot of this. We've seen a lot of this. We see a lot of, a lot of the um, young people, especially in either starting up their own NGOs or even those that start youth associations or those that start community groups, you know, they have that real commitment to helping out and improving the community, developing the community. Okay. So it starts with that. It starts with that commitment, that interest and that net intention to, to do it. Okay. Also another attitude you must have is a sensitivity to traditions and cultural practices, especially in a country like Malaysia, especially in the urban areas because urban areas are so diverse. So you must, you must develop a sensitivity to other traditions, other, other cultures. Okay, so social practices, traditions, uh, languages, okay, religious practices. Uh, you cannot be an effective CD worker without that. Okay, it's really, really important um, in every setting, but especially in a setting like in Malaysia. Okay, respect for people. Uh, Respect for ideas, respect for abilities, respect for opinion. This is a, this is a, uh, nowadays this is becoming more and more rare, harder to find, I should say, uh, that respect for people. Uh, if you go online and you look at what's happening on social media, for example, you see there's very little, <laughs> there's much less, I should say, much less uh, respect for others, especially, especially respect for other people's ideas. So we have, nowadays we have what's called cancel culture. Uh, does anybody know what cancel culture means? What is cancel culture? Who can share? Who can tell me what cancel culture means? Uh, prof? Cancel or cancel? Cancel. Huh? Cancel. Cancel or cancel? Cancel. Which one? Sorry, I'll cancel write it. Cancel or okay. I'll write it. I'll write it. Where is the... Sorry, it's cancel. Have you heard of this cancel culture? It's very big in, in Western countries now. I don't know if, if Malaysians are, are using this kind of uh, term terminology, but it happens a lot over social media. Uh, and it's actually, I think it's partially caused from social media. Because in social media, for example, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, you can, if somebody says something that you don't like, you can just, you can just block them, cancel them, 
you know, you sort of just, you, you can filter basically what you want to um, listen to, what you want to read and so forth. So it's created this idea of cancel culture. In other words, if people don't, if you don't agree with someone's ideas, you just cancel them rather than actually engaging with them, having some sort of discussion about the ideas, you know, the strengths, the weaknesses, what you agree with, what you don't agree with, and sort of coming to some agreement or at least agreeing that you disagree, you know, like people used to be able to do. Now they just, we just cancel, just get rid of them. I don't want to listen to this person, just cancel them out. Okay, so this is happening a lot in, in the Western context, but but we CD workers, we cannot do that. You know, you just cannot do that. You have to be able to and willing to engage with other people's ideas. All right, you're going to get people from all different backgrounds with different abilities, right? So being overly judgmental of those things is not going to allow you to really work with them. Okay, work with them for the benefit of the larger community. Okay, so... Urban areas, because, you know, urban areas, you get, uh, as I mentioned, you get a lot of diversity. The issues and the problems in urban areas are very complex. And people have different perspectives and different experiences with those problems. So you have to have an appreciation and a respect for the, the way that people have lived and, and experienced all those things and their understanding of it and their perspective of it. Okay, you have to really have an appreciation and respect for that. All right. So if you're going to do, if you're, if you're going to be a CD worker in the urban area, you must have or you must learn to have respect for others. Okay, and then of course, just have friendly attitude. I mean, most Malaysians don't have this problem. You guys are mostly friendly. Uh, Malaysians are very friendly. Okay, so friendly attitude is really helpful. Um, it does, it makes, and it makes a big difference. It makes a very big difference, um, especially in um, working with people from different backgrounds. You know, everybody can kind of, there's a sort of universal language of, you know, sort of just being a friendly, approachable, caring person. You know, there's a, there's sort of a, a universal appreciation for that, regardless of what culture you come from or background you come from, right? So I think that's a very important, it's actually a very important attitude to have when you do CD work, is to have that kind of friendly attitude. Okay, moving on. Any questions so far, comments? Uh, Pro? Yeah. Oops. Uh huh. Oh, basically, the cancer culture is like boycotting, right, Prof? It's like uh, boycott, right? Sort of, yeah, sort of like boycotting. It's yeah. Something like that, right? Yeah. Something like boycotting. Yeah, yeah. but it's like boycotting people, like boycotting their ideas. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not just like, you know, boycotting is like, usually it's boycotting is in terms of like a product or a country or something, you know, but this is like boycotting people's ideas, like or boycotting people because you don't like their ideas. Do you know I mean, it's very strange. It's very strange. It's like, oh, Hadi, you know, um, I have, you know, I take this, you know, I, I, I'm pro UMNO and Hadi is pro PKR. So I'm just not going to even listen to what Hadi says. I'm just going to completely just boycott him <laughs> because he has a pro PKR kind of mentality or something. It's that it's that kind of thing. Whereas in the past, you know, okay, so we differ, we disagree, we differ, but at least we can discuss, you know, we can agree to disagree, whatever, but I'm not going to boycott you or cancel you out just because we have differences of opinion. But nowadays people, because they have this very low threshold of tolerance for others' ideas, you know, for different ideas than theirs. People have a very low threshold for tolerance of that. So you can just cancel them out, boycott. So yeah, you can use the word boycott there. Uh, another attitude important for CD is willingness to learn. I don't think you HRD people have a problem with this, um, but you're gonna learn every day. My, my work in CD uh, in the community was really, you have, you'll learn something every day. You'll learn something every day. It's really interesting work. Um, uh, but you have to be willing to learn about people, right? Um, and it goes, it relates to the previous one on just having respect for people's ideas. Even though they may disagree, they, yours may be different than theirs, right? And you may, you may have very strong views on things, okay? But recognize that other people have strong views on things based on the way they were educated, the way they were brought up, their experiences in life, et cetera. Right. And so at least be willing to learn from others. And this is the exact opposite of cancel culture. 
Okay. So cancel culture is like, I don't even care what you say. I don't want to learn anything about you. Just, I'm just going to cancel you out, boycott you. The opposite is the willingness to learn. Okay. You have very strange views on things, but I want to, I want to learn about them. Where did you get these views from? How did you develop these views? Okay. The, that kind of attitude, the willingness to learn attitude is going to help you to be a much better CD worker. Okay. So you understand where these people are coming from, why they have these views that they have. What's been, what's influenced them, right? And that may even help you identify a problem that you want to develop a program for, right? You know, so maybe there's a, a, a group of residents in a community that, that really strongly feel that they're being, they're being discriminated against, right? And that's why they're having such a hard time in the community, right? But when you listen to them and you listen to their experiences and then you listen to those that interact with them and so forth, you learn that it's actually not discrimination. It's something else, right? And then, so based on that, you create a program or you create an intervention that can help these people, right? Um, rather than just saying, oh yeah, we, I agree with you. It's discrimination. It's actually not discrimination. It's something more system systemic. It has to do with the way that services have provided been provided or something. Okay, so... Take the time, be willing to learn about people and from people, okay? And then being able to adjust to local customs. And so, again, having respect for others, having respect for their culture, their customs, and then adjusting when you need to, right? Um, you know, so, I mean, Mal Malaysians, I think, are very amazing, amazingly tolerant when it comes to um, adjusting to each other's customs and so forth. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's, of course, there's always tension. There's always going to be tension, you know? Um, it's just, it's part and parcel of being human. When you have human differences, um, living together, there's going to be tension always. But I think in terms of the way that on the, on an everyday basis, just the way that people get along and they adjust to each other's customs and cultures, I think it's, it's a really amazing country, an amazing society. Right. And so that's an important part of community development work is having that attitude. Right. And of course this can be improved. Of course we can, with more understanding with more respect for one another we can improve on that but i think generally speaking it it, uh, it it does happen okay so abilities and attitudes of you know being good cd workers in the urban areas uh and then the last part is community participation and we've 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 talked to the, we've talked about this to some degree in the past okay so this is sort of a review a little bit all right but um a process of encouraging and awakening community to realize that they themselves have the abilities, capacities, and energies, and some resources to take initiatives to better the community. Okay, or sections of the community that become active and responsible in deciding what their problems and their solutions are. Okay, so again, good CD work is not doing for the community; it's doing with the community and facilitating the community to do it itself. Then you've really then you've really done the HRD work, which is empowering others, empowering others. All right, and so that's what it's really about. So getting people involved in their own sort of self improvement, self benefit, self development. Okay, and that's the whole idea. All right. So that goes very much against what sort of the way that I mean Malaysia over the past fifty plus years almost 60 years, um, the development of the country has been very much top down. And we've seen this in our discussion on the development plans and so forth. So the government has done a lot in the top down uh, to develop the country. So what, because of that, people sort of have this, have this expectation that the government is going to do this, the government's going to do that, right? We see this all the time. Now, is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. It's just that that's just the way the system has worked up to this point. Okay, but in community development work, we have to have a different mentality. Okay, if you just go in and say, okay, well, I'm here to help you get what you need from the government, then you're not really doing community development. You're just, you're just extending that sort of uh, a sense of dependency on the government. What you really want to do is you really want to help the community to, to empower themselves, right, so that they can become more uh, interde uh, independent. Right and self-reliant rather than reliant on the government all the time. Okay, so real CD work it, it's really predicated on this community participation, so that young uh, people can empower themselves. And so now, I mean, actually, the pandemic 
COVID-19 pandemic is a good example of why it's so important that we, we know that people are um, educated and people are facilitated to not be so reliant on the government because what happens when the government runs out of resources? And we're seeing this now with the COVID-19, right? The government is pretty much out of resources. There's not much more they can do just because they don't have the resources. Right? And so a lot of people are suffering because of that, right? So that's why we need to really focus on helping people to help themselves, helping people to help themselves. And that's the, that is one of the major roles of community development is to help communities to help themselves. So community participation is the central point of CD work, getting the community involved from beginning to end. Okay, this is so important, it's right? so important. All right. And so, of course, if they're going to be involved, if they're going to be participating, that assumes that you've built some relationship with them because they want to be involved. Right? And for them to want to be involved, they have to know who you are. They have to trust you, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why that building that rapport with community is so important. What is not community particip participation? Getting the community to go along and agree with programs already decided and designed for them. Okay, and this is, we see this a lot. Let's face it, let's be honest. We see this a lot in at the level of community development. We see this a lot, you know? The top-down program comes in, community joins, it's over, they all go home and nothing else happens. That's not really community participation. Okay, they're involved as recipients, but they're not really participating per se. They're just contributing some labor, maybe they're supporting some of the political leaders, right? Maybe there's an improvement in government services, but it's not really community participation. So it's not going to be as sustainable. So this all this is all about sustainability. How do you make community development sustainable? Okay, so it has to be through community participation. Otherwise, it cannot be sustainable. There's no way. Who's going to carry it on once the government goes home? Once the government officers go back to their houses in Putrajaya, who's going to continue to do the community, community development work? It has to be the community itself. All right, so the, the community must participate. All right, so how to do it? Help facilitate, help the community to ident identify its own problems and needs. Okay, so we've, we've, we've talked about, oops, what did I just do? Uh, oh, it's the chat box. Uh, community assists in collecting its own information. Huh, interesting. And we've done this, I've seen this, I've seen youth programs do this. They get the young people in the community to go out and to survey the communities, right? So the young people become like researchers in their own communities. So that's one way, okay? The community suggests solutions to their problems, all right? So you have a series of like town hall settings or, um, you know, uh, town hall meetings um, uh, where the community just gives suggestions and ideas and there's discussion on, on how to do that, what makes the most sense, et cetera. And that community sets priorities. So they, I, the community identifies what their own priorities are. Okay, first we have to address this, then we have to address this. You know, this is the biggest problem facing us. We know we just don't have enough facilities for our young people. You know, what can we do to provide them with more meaningful activities? You know, something like that, All right? So they set their own priorities. Okay, so again, you're just there to facilitate that process as the CD worker. Community, uh, this is a continuation. So the community then makes joint decisions and plans. So the community decides, and that's not gonna be everybody in the community. Obviously not everyone's gonna participate, but as long as you have a, you know some kind of participation, maybe it's just a, a small group of leaders. Of course you want as much participation as possible, but in every community, they, you know, it, it varies. Sometimes you get a lot of participation, sometimes there's only a few, but whatever it is, it should be from the community. I mean, a lot of, I think in a lot of Malaysian communities, they already have their sort of leadership, community leadership, right? So that the community associations and all that. So they will be the ones that are making most of the decisions, but you can facilitate, you can facilitate and promote that there's more participation from the community, other community members. Uh, the community finds resources, both locally and outside the community. The community takes responsibility for specific projects and outcomes. Okay, so the more they can handle on their own, the better let them handle it, just provide support for them to do it. 
and then the community assistance, supervision, and evaluation. And this is where you can train as the CD worker, you can train them on how to do evaluation. Very simple evaluation, but you can train them on it and train them on why it's important to do it. And a lot of people don't a lot of people don't realize why evaluation is important. Okay, so it can really help improve the program for the next time. Okay, so this is um, this is a, an exercise. So that that's it for the um, for the lecture today. Uh, are there any are there any any questions about that? Any questions? No, clear. Uh, prof. Yeah. Just want to ask, uh, uh, regarding your opinion, what can you compare between the community development in US, USA, and in Asia? What can you compare oh. between both countries? Very, very good question. Uh, very good question, Adi. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of it is, I think it differs in a lot of ways um, according to the system of government and just the culture of participation. So like, in America, there's an expect America, when we say like America is a very is a democratic country, it's not just the fact that the federal government is a democracy. American democracy goes all the way down to the community level. Right. So even in communities, the communities operate very democratically. So for example, like whenever you have any kind of community organization at any level, there's always elections and there's always um, representation and participation from the members. You know, so for example, like a school, like even the school system, the schools are, the school boards, the local school boards are elected by the people, right? And then they have meetings where the residents in the community will voice out their opinions and, and so forth on what the schools should do, for example. Okay, so it's, it's from the top all the way to the bottom, it's very democratic in that sense. So people expect, so when it comes to community development work, people expect to have a say in things. They expect to participate, right? And so you, you can't do it any other way in, a, in the U.S. because it just will never work. People will just not, you know, they'll kick you out. They'll, they won't accept you. Whereas in Malaysia, Malaysia is a much more hierarchical system to call it based on history, culture, everything. It's a different system. It's, demo, it's still democratic. It's also democratic, but it's a different it's a different flavor of democracy. Um, and, and, you know, democracies are very broad. There's different ways of doing democracy. So it's, it's a much more hierarchical structure. Um, and even the culture is more hierarchical. So there's more of a people put, put more expectation on leaders to do things, um, to play, so I think, bigger roles. There's less of an expectation of direct participation like you get in the U.S., Right. So I think some of the things that I just discussed in the lecture today are probably a bit more challenging to do in Malaysia, just because of the fact that people are not used to participating at that level as much. Right. But it still happens. And when it does happen, it, it can be very, uh, it can be very effective. You know, so you have, so of course, you have to take these things into consideration. You know, like, so when you're working in a Malaysian community, you realize that, like I said, not everybody's going to be okay with or interested in participating it's just it's just the culture so be aware of that but that's okay i mean that's okay you don't have to start you don't have to have 80 or 90 percent participation you know you can start with just that small that small group of community leaders and then from there try to build on that or and whatnot so be flexible you have to be very, you have to be very flexible when you when you do community work but the thing is is to try to let the community lead as much as possible try to let them drive the whole process and you, as and whenever you can, just provide support, provide direction, provide whatever skills they need. You know, provide training, whatever it is. Um, and so that, so that's, so I think that's a that's a big difference, Hadi. Uh, but that's a great question. I mean, you, I could spend probably a couple of hours talking about all the different ways that I've seen. Um, so, any other? Any other? Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Why is my screen black? I don't have it in my, oh, I think it's because of the, nothing else. Oh, Nabila has, I thought cancel culture is canceling people with offensive remarks. Yeah, well, that's part of it. Uh, Nabila, yes. 
So that that is what you're what you're saying there is cancel culture. But it hit. But my point is that it has extended beyond that. Okay, so that is originally what it was what it was for was to cancel out those types of things, right? Which of course everybody can uh, people can accept. But it's it's gotten to the point where people have taken it to such an to such a, a an extreme that they apply it to anyone that disagrees with them. Okay, and of course you see it in a lot of more more high profile cases like um, where you see like very sort of public figures engaging in debate and then suddenly they just you know they just remove them or even universities are doing this now in the U.S. Like in the U.S. The idea of academic freedom is one of the pillars of the university system. So if I'm an academic in the university, I, I'm expected that I have freedom to say whatever I want, to publish whatever I want, because it's expected that, I mean, it's based on my, so my expertise, or it's supposed to be based on my expertise. But now even universities are engaging in this idea of cancel culture, whereas if I publish something that the university does not agree with, they will cancel me out. They will not allow me to actually express my views. And that's another manifestation of cancel culture that's happening on university campuses in the US, which has never really happened before. This is something new. So you're right. It, it started that way. Um, and it's kind of got it's kind of gone beyond that now. Uh, it's gone way beyond that now. Um, and social media has a lot to do with it because social media facilitates it. Uh, you can just easily just remove people. Like twit, like look at um. I mean, I think most people are aware of like Donald Trump, former president of the U.S., um, how Twitter, Facebook, they just canceled him. They just they just they just prevented him from they closed his accounts and they told him he couldn't post anymore. Right. So, I, I mean, I don't agree with many of the things he says, but should that does that mean that he should be just completely canceled out like that? You know, does he not have a, a, a right to say what he what he believes and so forth? So that's that's the debate. That's the issue that's being debated now. So anyway, but thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you for raising that question. Okay, so we will stop there for today since there are no other questions. All right, so, um, Week 12, so you only have two more weeks, okay? I hope, um, well, three more weeks, really. So I hope everything's going well. I hope your your proposals are, are, are going and proceeding, okay? If you have any questions or any problems, just let me know. Are you guys are you guys still okay with the due date of week 14, or would, or would you like to negotiate that? I'm open to negotiation. We can extend the date if you need so, if you need to. Or is week 14 still okay? Jesse's going like this. Yeah, but I think, yeah, I think we, I think, I think we are okay with the date, I think. Okay. Okay. Still okay. All right. Well, if you need more time, if you do need more time, just let me know next week or, uh, well, yeah, wait, all right, it has to be next week. Next week is week 13. Uh, well, let me know by next week and we can, we can consider adjusting the date if we need to. But Prof, but Prof, sure. Okay, guys. So thank you for your um, for your participation, and we will shall I see each other next week. Thank you, Prof. All right. Okay. So all right. Bye, Bye, Prof.